Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with If I Could Choose Only One Work by Composer X, It Would Have to Be Work W. Well, Composer X is Glinka. Not a composer we think about all that often, is he? And Work W is Kamarinskaya. Now, this is probably the shortest major work that we're going to be talking about in this series, or one of them. It's only about five or six minutes long. And as a composer, Glinka is kind of all over the place. It's really fascinating to look at his output. I mean, he wrote two operas, right? Uh, A Life for the Tsar and, and, and Ruslan and Ludmila. And then he did a lot of songs and romances that nobody ever plays and a few chamber works for interesting combinations, some of which are quite lovely, but they're they're kind of rarefied. There's like one disc's worth of them. I've got it sitting over there. And then there's like three or four little orchestral pieces. There's there are the two Spanish overtures, and which are wonderful, by the way. And then there's Kamarinskaya, and there's the Ruslan and Ludmila overture and some dance things. And that's it. I mean, it actually adds up to a fairly chunky bottle of body of work, but it's it's all over the place. And if you read his biography, which I did, which is marvelous, by the way, he's he's he had a fascinating life. I mean, he trained in Italy, and you can tell. I mean, his chamber music consists of you know fantasies and things for small ensembles, or like themes by Bellini and people like that. He had his Milan period, and then he was in France and Spain, where he caught venereal disease. He's very honest about it. Um, and had a very good time doing it, by the way. Um, and he, he spent not too much time in Russia. There wasn't that much musical life in Russia, actually. Um, but when he got back, he produced his operas and did some things. And, and this is all in the 1840s and 50s and 60s. One of the things that fascinates me about Glinka is that he was a vibrato guy. He actually uses the term, which he picked up from his sojourn in Italy, and and uses it in his scores, in his orchestral scores, so that you could actually tell um, you know, when people should use extra vibrato, even in an orchestral context, and when singers did it, which is really very, very important. Um, and fascinating in a performance practice sense, and nobody looks at him. Never mind those period instrument people. They would never look at Glinka, but he's a gold mine of performance practice indications because he was very precise. He was one of those meticulous composers who notated everything, which is really kind of cool. Most people don't know that about him, so you've heard it here first, folks. Anyway, why is Kamarinskaya? so important and characteristic and marvelous. Well, it is the first piece of orchestral music based entirely on Russian folk themes. And as a structure, it consists of nothing but repetition. There are two alternating tunes, and they just get repeated with varied orchestration for about five or six minutes, you know, in a steady crescendo and diminuendo, and they come and they go, and they do their repetitious things, and the tunes are very catchy. They're absolutely lovely. It's just a little gem. And from, as they say, from little acorns, mighty oak trees grow, because this was the piece that got the whole Russian folk romantic nationalist school going. It really was. I, I, you know, there was nothing else like it, and it's 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 a marvelous little 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 piece of of uh, musical masterpieceosity. It's just lovely. And Glinka, like I said, is very very interesting composer because. You know, he, his his source material, his style, his training was all abroad. It was all outside of Russia. And then he came back and he founded what was effectively a national school by synthesizing these foreign elements um, with his own genius and with the native music that he found. And he didn't do a lot of it because there was no market for it in Russia in the 1840s and 50s. There just wasn't at that time. You know, Russians... Russia, the Russian classical music, if we call it classical music, art music tradition was basically opera, as it was in France. It was essentially a French slash Italian musical culture. There were not major orchestral forces and orchestral concerts and series and 
you know, it was dominated by the aristocracy, of course. I mean, Russia was behind the rest of Europe at the time. And it was Glinka who sort of sort of dragged Russia into into at least what was then the mid 19th century, the romantic period by this very, very limited but really important series of works. And so the choice has to be Kamarinskaya. Go listen to it. It's just a delightful little piece. And most people don't know it at all, but an incredibly important one and um, a delight. And if I have to give this to the evil god Kankra's ends uh, and, and make the case for not destroying the rest of Glinka's output or classical music generally, I would say to the god Kankrazans, listen, here's the piece of music that birthed a beautiful, beautiful school of music, one that we love dearly and with dozens and dozens of works that we would never, ever want to sacrifice. And from this wonderful embryonic cell, you can't possibly deny us the opportunity to hear all of the wonderful things that sprang forth from the same fertile ground. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.